everyone and welcome to another episode of Uncharted Maritime Tales, a podcast for all things maritime archaeology. I'm Jasmine. And I'm Greta. And this week we're diving into the topic of marine life and maritime archaeology. How do they interact? Can they coexist? Or are they even a threat to each other? This podcast has been created as part of our Fathoming the Future project, made possible thanks to the National Lottery Heritage Fund. So I think it's quite interesting because when I started learning about maritime archaeology, this actually wasn't something I considered too much. But looking a bit more into it, it's a really fascinating topic, just thinking about how heritage may shape the future of our ocean's health. And of course, with a growing awareness of climate change, it seems to become a lot more prevalent in the public conscious, but especially with initiatives such as the UN's Decade of Ocean Science, which is running 2021 to 2030. So it's only just recently started. And this is a framework to support the efforts to reverse the cycle of decline in ocean health. Absolutely. And on the topic of the UN Decade of Ocean Science, Gary Momba, the Trust Director, will be talking about the decade and the link between archaeology and climate change very shortly. But first, going back to marine life and archaeology, there is a lot of questions surrounding this topic. A little while ago on one of our YouTube videos, there was the question, can heritage and wildlife conservation work together or are they at odds with each other? Yeah, I remember that question. And that's actually the reason why we've created this podcast, because it's such a vast topic with lots of different sides. So this can really be split into two main areas. So the first, you've got shipwrecks as marine habitats. And then the second is considering shipwrecks and the changing environment. So going back to the first, shipwrecks as marine habitats, this can be broken down again into two subcategories. So you've got, first of all, shipwrecks, that are purposely scuttled with the aim that they will become artificial reefs. You know, they're scientifically studied for their relationship to marine life and biodiversity. And then the other part is you've got historical shipwrecks. Now, they're not purposely sunk. They're sunk in an accident. They have a wealth of potential, but they aren't studied at all as artificial reefs. And then go back to the second area, shipwrecks in the environment. Again, there's two things to consider here, or maybe rather two questions. First of all, can shipwrecks be a danger to the environment? You know, think about a historical ship, it's sunk, it's eroding, things might be leaking, the cargo might actually be dangerous. Or can, the flip side to that, can the environment be a danger to the shipwreck in situ? So again, considering things like ocean acidification, shipworms, which we'll come to in a little bit, there's lots of factors which we are going to try and cover. So going back to the very first one, Shipwrecks are really useful as artificial reefs. I know there's quite a few around Florida and obviously you you have to be conscious that creating an artificial reef isn't going to cause more damage. You've got things like toxic paints, rusting metal particles, you know, even asbestos, which are only going to cause more problems or exacerbate any existing pollution. And you also don't want to cause any imbalance with the native ecosystem. Because I was reading uh, about a ship that ran aground near Hawaii And because of iron leaching, it caused an influx of a particular type of sea anemone, which caused too much algae to grow. Oh, right. Yeah, it was was really interesting because it's something I never really thought about. But they certainly can be useful. And if done correctly, they can be really beneficial. You hear, of, for example, of New York subway carriages being used as artificial reefs and having removed the dangerous materials. And you can actually see photos of these online if you'd like to. It's really interesting. But I think the largest artificial reef is the USS uh, Riscany and it was a 44,000 ton aircraft carrier. And wow. The, yeah, it was, it's huge. And again, if you see photos of this online, I think you see YouTube videos and the Florida Keys National Maritime Sanctuary, it's home to about 61 artificial reefs. I just love the idea that from the moment a ship sinks, it, it starts a new life and it becomes a home for a new habitat. That's really lovely that, you know, man-made things can work together with nature and provide homes and shelter for that wildlife. But of course, as well, some of those wrecks will be protected wrecks. But because they're protected, that also means that the wildlife that lives on them will be protected as well. And vice versa, where there's protected um, ecosystems, those can help protect the wrecks and the maritime heritage that ends up within it. So it goes both ways. Yeah, absolutely. I I mean, there are quite a few interesting articles as well that have come out about this. um, Just to consider the other side of the argument thinking about how shipwrecks may need to be protected whilst in situ. One example, and this is more about climate change rather than the marine environment necessarily, but 
I remember when the endurance was discovered, there was fear about its preservation, especially with ocean acidification and melting ice and how these may harm a ship like the Endeavour. But like I said, that's a bit more about climate change, really, rather than marine. But of course, one answer is, well, can we raise it? But not everything can be the Mary Rose. We can't raise everything. So it becomes a question of how do we preserve ships in situ? But how do some ships with potentially dangerous cargo then also not become a danger to the environment? Because you've got, you've got things like oil spills and the real famous one that we always talk to people on the bus about, which is the SS Richard Montgomery off Sheerness in Kent. Um, so that one, for anyone who isn't familiar with it, is a shipwreck that lies in uh, yeah the mouth of the River Thames and it is filled with a huge amount of explosives from the Second World War and unfortunately yeah. it's degrading over time um, but it hasn't been brought up and they can't really do much with it because if you start poking around in there that could yeah be quite <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Well, so Villa's in a bit more about this. One of our Fathoming the Future volunteers, Benita, she's actually researched the relationship between marine life and shipwrecks in particular. Uh, you can actually find her blog entitled Shipwrecks and the Environment, Friend or Foes, on our website. And this includes pictures of some of the fish and the other marine life that she mentions as well. Can wrecks really serve as artificial reefs? Shipwrecks can become marine life havens, supporting a high biodiversity of fish, invertebrates and algae. The hard substrate that wrecks provide creates shelter and refuges for species at larval, juvenile and adult stages, establishing its own ecosystem. Microorganisms, such as bacteria from the surrounding environment, are among the first to colonise, forming a foundation of biofilm, which is attractive to the settlement of planktonic larvae of benthic reef fauna, such as algae, anemones and sponges. These will in turn attract more mobile fauna, such as crabs, lobster and fish, looking for food and places to hide. The ex-Royal Navy frigate HMS Scylla was sunk purposefully in 2004 off the Cornwall coast and provides an excellent example of how a shipwreck can provide a complex marine habitat over time. Barnacles, tube worms and hydroids settled within a month with sea urchin, queen scallop, ascidians, sea stars and ephemeral algae discovered in the first year. Rass and sea fans established after a few years, bringing the number of species to 263 by 2009. The area surrounding the Lundy Islands is rich with wrecks, including P.S. Iona 2, H.M.S. Montague and M.V. Robert. Among the conger eels, lobster, wrasse, bib and plumos anemones, communities of horseshoe worms growing around M.V. Roberts's limestone cannonballs are distinctive to this area. Conga eels peer out of the nooks and crannies created by the degraded structure of the ship, leaving at night to hunt for food. Lobster are also nocturnal hunters, feeding on almost anything organic, coloured dark blue with pale yellow markings and red antennae. Bib are coppery coloured fish with distinctive bands and a single chin barb, forming shoals around wrecks. Other fish such as Sprat and John Dory are common wreck finds. But can wrecks also be at risk? Older shipwrecks built of wood provide an abundant food source for marine boring organisms and some bacteria and fungi. Ancient mariners knew all too well of the central role played by marine borers, especially shipworms, in ship degradation. Shipworms, not worms at all, are molluscan bivalves which enter the wood at their larval stage, growing elongated to a worm-like body in a burrow within the wood. The shipworm twists and burrows into the wood using serrated edged valves. Whilst the wood on the outside may look intact, extensive honeycomb-like tunnels can be found internally. 
the shipworm secretes a substance to protect it from harmful chemicals in the wood. Teredo nivalis is perhaps the most well-known shipworm species, widespread in the UK, Europe and North America. With a growth rate of 0.5 to 1 mm per day in temperate waters, a 20 cm long piece of wood would be completely consumed by Teredo nivalis within a year. Shipworms are responsible for extensive damage to well-known wrecks such as the Mary Rose and led to the early retrieval of significant archaeological parts of the Swash Channel wreck before it succumbs to degradation. The other major group of wood borers found on UK shipwrecks are Gribble, a group of incredibly small woodlouse-like crustaceans which burrow just below the wood surface. They create a superficial branching lace-like pattern which is more detectable than shipworm damage but finer than shipworm holes, almost like tiny pinpricks. Gribble are spread through infested wood as they have limited swimming ability. Can wrecks also create risk? The potential long-term environmental impact of shipwrecks has frequently been overlooked. From World War I onwards, many ships were fuelled by oil and carried large volumes in their holds. Seawater gradually corrodes the metal components of ships such as their ferrous hulls and metal boilers, leading to eventual collapse and releasing vast amounts of stored oil into the water. It is estimated over 8,000 wrecks worldwide threaten to release their stored oil. Heavy metals, including copper, nickel, mercury, cadmium, arsenic and chromium, were used to strengthen ships, and as they erode slowly, these leach into the water and sediments. Mercury and cadmium have been shown to be toxic to bivalve mollusks such as barnacles and chromium has been linked to poor reproductive capacity in whales. Many World War I and World War II wrecks bring the additional risk of carrying numerous unexploded mines and bombs aboard, creating environmental and public risk as the ships degrade. So can heritage and marine conservation work together? Both marine archaeology and conservation are affected by the use of the marine environment, such as mining and fishing. So it would make sense to encourage cooperation between them to help ensure the future of the marine environment. Archaeology may also help communicate important messages about sustainable use of our oceans in the past and in the future. Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage, or MUCH, is concerned with the relationship between people and the marine and coastal environment over time. Using tools such as archaeology to investigate how the ocean was used through historical maritime artefacts. Historical shipwrecks not only provide valuable insights into our history and relationship with the sea, but can create marine life refuges and unique habitats. Their degradation is vulnerable to many factors, some out of our control. And their deterioration does bring with it some pollution hazards. Collaboration between heritage and marine science interests is developing to help address the challenges facing our shipwrecks and oceans. Great, well thank you Benita. It's really interesting to consider both arguments. The shipworms in particular are really incredible and we actually have a piece of timber on the discovery bus that has unfortunately fallen prey to both gribble and shipworm and it's so interesting to think when you look at it at first glance it looks completely fine but then you examine it closely and it's really hollowed out inside and that's actually one of our favorites to put under the microscope we always do this don't we when we oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> we take this uh, we always take the kids over particularly if we have to go do a school run with the bus 
and we take the kids over to the microscope, we put it under, and the reaction we get from them is absolutely incredible because you can still see tiny gribble inside the timber. They're not alive anymore, which is usually people's first question, but you can definitely still see them. Yeah, that's definitely one of my favourite things to show people. Yeah. It's just got the range of reactions <laughs> there. <laughs> but what Benita's research also does highlight is how the marine environment encompasses more than just wildlife or archaeology alone. Hmm. So when we take a holistic view of that environment, we can apply that information not just below the waves, but above as well. So we've been working on this project. Um, it's an interreg funded project called Sustainable and Resilient Coastal Cities, which seeks out nature based solutions to protect coastal cities from flooding and from coastal change. And our role in that project has been to explore past coastal change through the proxy measurement of archaeological sites to help inform future plans. Archaeological sites can inform us about climate and coastal change in two particular ways, their position in relation to the modern shoreline and through their contents. So if, for example, we find the remains of a building offshore, we know that the sea has encroached since that time it was built. Likewise, if we find plant remains at an underwater or coastal site for plants which like the drier inland conditions, this can show the same thing. If the plant remains are also dated, it could also give an index point for the sea level at the time that they were growing. One of the SART pilot sites at which this has demonstrated is Middlekirk in Belgium, and here we know that peat extraction and drainage development during the Roman period caused the land level to lower, after which the sea slowly progressed more inland, possibly due to increasing neglect of the water management systems during this period. So that is clear evidence of how human activity is changing the coastal landscape. And human impact on the coast and the marine environment is a key concern of the UN's ocean decade. Our director, Gary Momba, talks more about this initiative. So I'm here with Gary, who is director of the Maritime Archaeology Trust, and we're going to be talking a little bit about the UN Decade of Ocean Science. So Gary, what is the UN's Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, and, and what are the aims of the initiative? Well, the UN Decade of Ocean Science was set up to really address the health of the oceans, which are in pretty bad state. And the idea is it was going to run between 2021 and 2030. And the aim, really, or say the motivation behind it, was to support efforts to sort of reverse the cycle of decline in ocean health and create improved conditions. And the vision is the science we need for the ocean we want. So really it's looking at all different methods we can identify to try and make the ocean a much better place. So it's driving initiatives and programmes with different scientists working together to address lots of different issues, uh, which I'll go into some of the archaeological ones in a minute, but lots of different issues that really try and really improve the health of the oceans. So you mentioned archaeology just there, so how can archaeology work to combat that? Well there's lots of different ways archaeology can help um, and I think to try and pinpoint some of them down I'll run through some of the outcomes, this, the aspirations of this UN decade, what the outcomes will be. Um, and they're divided into uh, seven different outcomes and if you just bear with me I'll just run through them, they're short and snappy and then I can address how the archaeology can help. So there's a clean ocean, fairly straightforward, a healthy and resilient ocean, a productive ocean, a predicted ocean, a safe ocean, an accessible ocean, and an inspiring and engaging ocean. I'd argue that what we found is that, that underwater cultural heritage can add pretty much something to all those different outcomes that I outlined just now. Uh, so with a clean ocean, you have heritage and pollution. Um, with a healthy and resilient ocean, You've got heritage and ecosystems. With a productive ocean, you've got the use of traditional knowledge, knowing where fishing grounds are and this sort of thing, and using uh, looking at different, uh, um, uh, uh, looking at sort of traditions and sites and communities and oral histories. A predictive ocean, where you can sort of understand how the ocean is working through, in our particular roles that we do work here, sort of looking at some of those landscapes, looking at the changes in the landscape through time, using the archaeology to help inform climate change, sea level rise, all that sort of issue that sort of within the trust we're working on this large European uh, sustainable and resilient coastal cities project, oh, Yes, yeah. uh, for instance the SAR project. Um, there's issues of a safe ocean, well, I mean you can use stories of ships and tsunamis and events of tsunamis on land to show what happens when, well that's also predictive ocean, 
the impacts it can have on the land as ships that sail on the sea of course lots of them sank not very safe so you've got these lessons to be learned from the safe ocean the accessible ocean where we got uh, areas where people can get more involved and i suppose it's looking at the shipwrecks looking at the sites around the shipwrecks and seeing look at seeing maybe as our fish or reefs mm. and how and getting divers on them getting to see them and then there's something that we're doing now a lot of sort of photogrammetry and filming and visualization of the ocean floor and all these monuments all these shipwrecks that are there that can tell the story make it more exciting tell the story of the ocean bed because i was going to ask you is a lot of it theoretical but it does seem like there's a lot of ways that can be put into action do you think a shipwreck can be used as a snapshot to indicate the health of the ocean around it um well it, it's a snapshot but it's a long-term snapshot so mm. it's a temporal snapshot so the point is you have the record when it went down mm. you've got certain communities built up then and through time they might have changed so you might have different sort of as the temperatures got warmer if they have in a place you might get different sort of say benthic communities built up on in layers one on top of another so you have a sort of a stratigraphy of different forms of um a uh, bit mollusks or whatever they might be that are grown on the site that can reflect that change and give you a record of that change and arguably beneath some of these wrecks you'll have sediments that have been deposited just before the wreck went down because they're hidden underneath it they might be 300 years old mm. those sediments will have certain chemical compositions maybe from an within them that you can use to help understand changes in, in ocean acidification for instance mm -hmm. and then you can compare that with adjacent uh, sediments to see how that nice preserved sediment changes compares with the, the one next door so there's a lot of scientific elements you, you can uh, bring to play in here Mm -hmm. um, you did mention about accessibility with people and I think mm. there is a role and the role is with citizen science um, there's a role for lots of people to get involved uh, and dive on some of these sites and take some basic records and use those records and contribute by feeding them in, into a set sort of hub let's mm. say and it, that is in the process of being developed hopefully mm. um, so that we can engage with citizens I mean there's lots of initiatives around the globe where citizens dive and record um, shipwrecks, artificial sites, and um, lots of really good initiatives. Mm. So, if you were a diver and you were wanting to contribute in a healthy way or in a in a way that you felt could be valuable, do you, you think that in the future they would be able to get in contact? I think they will be. I say there are certain initiatives. I'm sure that they could find out that people can start contributing. I mean, be it sea search or whatever, and then the uh, polluting wrecks, or even work with, we're doing with the trust. I mean, and then to get that information and feed it back to try and tell us more about. Um, yeah, more about changes or what's actually living on the wrecks mm. at the moment that we can then start compare and contrast. Now that's work in progress. So right. let's say we at the moment we don't have the questions lined out. That's something that's actually being developed in the relatively near future. Discussions are ongoing about getting those questions set up and put out to the divers, etc. who might be there and then we'll hopefully we'll encourage people to come forward and start um engaging and, and, and contributing to that understanding. Oh, great, because you can often see that on the coastal edge where you, people say, oh, if you stand here, you can then upload your photo and monitor coastal change. So it's a bit difficult when it's underwater. So it's nice that people can contribute. Well, hopefully, yes. I mean, that would be the, probably the same sort of process because we wouldn't want to encourage people poking around on shipwrecks, but <laughs> photographs, uh, look but don't touch, I think is uh, the approach we would take. And that information would then be fed back. But at the moment, um, they need to be scientifically... Um, I suppose the, the questions need to be scientifically prepared, collated, so that we get a consistent answers. Uh, so that's something I say we're working on. So. Okay. Oh, sounds great. Watch your space. Yeah, sounds very exciting. Uh, and finally, I was just going to ask you, what is the Maritime Archaeology Trust doing as part of the Decade of Ocean Science? Or is that quite a hard thing to <laughs> start? Well, well, on a, a fairly straightforward level, we're working within the Shipwreck Centre and developing um, exhibitions in, in involving the Decade of Ocean Science. Uh, with some of our initiatives uh, from the you know the site project I mentioned, sustainable and resilient coastal cities, that of course is looking at climate change and trying to understand how we can use archaeology and heritage and history to read and interpret the long term changes in the coastline. So that's already in place. We're we're doing that. We're going to be developing education resources along the lines as well, and hopefully we're going to be fairly instrumental in some of the proposals that I mentioned earlier. I should mention that we're we're part of the. Um, uh, we're a non-government organisation accredited by the UN, uh, the UNESCO Convention on the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage, and we're fairly active as an NGO in that, and we're working through that to put proposals to UNESCO about how we could introduce the underwater cultural heritage and link it 
to the decade of ocean science through sort of blue literacy and the various themes that I've spoken of today. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, Gary, for that great rundown of the UN's Decade of Ocean Science. The initiative is just so important, and we're sure that through the collaboration of different sectors and communities, it will be a great success. Yeah, yeah, hopefully so. And just focusing in on the archaeology's role in the decade, it's just it's so interesting when Gary was saying about the different communities building on shipwrecks as the sea gets warmer, and how as we have a record of the ship's loss over time, we can almost see like a stratigraphy of these communities growing. And it's also really great that hopefully soon citizen divers, for those of you out there, will be able to get involved really soon and collect some data if you want to. Yes, exactly. So keep an eye out for that one. Well, thanks again for listening and joining us today, and um, we'll see you all soon. Thanks, bye!